I don't know whether to speak collectively or just speak to everybody individually this morning. <laughs> I was talking about it with several folks. A little bit of the summertime left. Now, that don't mean it's going to cool off. It just means school's starting. And everybody's trying to get that vacation in before it does. Anybody here raised during the, the time that crops had to be harvested before school could start? Well, not maybe so much here in Central Florida, but pretty much, and, and, and it's true, was true here too. There used to be a little more farming going on around here than you think. But school couldn't start till the kids got the harvest is harvest end up there in South Georgia. You say, well, that wasn't the hottest Florida. Have you been there? <laughs> yes, sir. It got bad. Not only that, Florida had a little more breeze, I think, and less gnats. How many of you know what gnats are? Okay, all right, well, all right. Preaching to an educated group then this morning. All right, I'll quit that, and let's go to John chapter 4. I'm going to finish chapter 4. Uh, it's possible the wife and I are going to make it up to see the grandkids this coming week, so I may not be here next week, depending on kind of on, on uh, whether she feels up to it or not. But um, I'm sure you can take care of things. I'm going to turn it over to Brother Perkins and Brother Bert and, and all the rest of them that was doing a good job before I started teaching the class. Amen. <laughs> Appreciate Brother Parsons still allowing me that, uh, that privilege. Open your Bibles to John chapter 4. I know we've been in it a long time, but it's a long chapter. Not 54 verses in it. We'll get down to the end or call it done this morning anyway. Uh, chapter by chapter and verse by verse as we go through John. Remember John was the youngest disciple uh, during the time of Christ on the earth. Remember that uh, he probably wound up being the oldest before being martyred. He was not martyred. They tried to kill John. There's, history tells us they tried to boil him in oil, and somehow that didn't work. And they exiled him to the prison island of Patmos, and it was on Patmos that he gave us the book of Revelation. So God wasn't through with him. You know, there's a comfort in that. God's not going to let you go until he's through with you. <laughs> That's his will. Amen? You, you walk in his will. And... Uh, the truth of the matter is, uh, I, I like something. I got home from camp early enough to watch the end of the Republican uh, convention. They done a good job as a whole. I appreciated Franklin Graham getting in John 3:16. Did anybody see that? Yeah, and uh, and some other good, lot a lot of good things. Well, I, I enjoy the I enjoyed the so-called common Americans that got to get up and tell their stories. I appreciated uh, uh, that uh, uh, very much. And uh, I was thinking about it as Sister Rich was singing. I appreciate that song. And uh, President Trump, coming, the bullet coming so close to taking his life, uh, he got up and gave God credit for that. Amen. And I appreciated that uh, very, very much. And... Uh, Speaking of the martyrs and John being the oldest and all that, and, and they couldn't take John until God was through with him. And that's a comforting thought. Uh, from time to time, I hear folks say as a pastor through the years, uh, I don't know why God left me. And I often said to them, well, maybe he's got something else for you to do yet. It's not your time yet. And God's, God's the one that calls the shots. Amen. And we praise, praise the Lord. A little pond on that. God's the one that called the shots. That's why the assassin's bullet missed. <laughs> and we don't know the whole story on it. I've already heard some, some uh, strange things being said. Some of them may be true. I don't know. Uh, we have had a government that has not been transparent for a long, long time. And we find out things a little bit later than we should often. Somebody said... Uh, they believe a third gun was involved because the gunshots all had different sounds to them. Could be. I don't know. Uh, could be. Uh, God knows. Amen. <laughs> and whatever the plan was, uh, it wasn't God's plan, so the man's still going. 
And, and I'm going to get off that in just a minute, get back here to the scripture. But anybody hear Dr. Ben Carson uh, speech? He's the uh, surgeon, remember? Ben Carson. Good testimony of knowing the Lord. He quoted fairly accurate, pretty, pretty close word for word, Isaiah 54, 17. And appropriate, it was an appropriate text for him to take. And that verse tells us that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Amen. And then he pointed out they'd done everything else to get rid of Trump. And now trying to kill him and that didn't work either. That's a pretty good, pretty good little message from uh, uh, Dr. Carson there. So God's still on the throne. Uh, I went back and studied again, which I have done many times. I think I even have a little book that, that was written on the book of Daniel, maybe the last time I taught it. You read over there where Nebuchadnezzar <clears throat> had to learn the lesson that God is the one that puts you on the throne and takes you off the throne. That's a good, that's about chapter 5 of Daniel. That's a good one to read and think about it. God is still sovereign. He's still going to have his will, no matter the schemes and plans uh, that men bring, bring around. And uh, so somebody says, what about the election? Well, we'll see what God's going to do with it. <clears throat> God may have already voted. Did you think about that? He might have already cast his vote. With that bullet missing, I don't know. I can't say. I'd like to think that over what else is out there. <laughs> I'd like to think that, but I don't know. It's up to the Lord. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. I'm going to trust God with it. Amen. Amen. All right. That didn't cost you nothing. John chapter 4. Uh, we ended up talking about the two days and how it was a type and picture of the probably the 2,000 years of the church age where the Lord has been ministering to the Gentiles. The church age is about to close. It'll close with the rapture, calling the bride home, and then the seven-year tribulation, Jacob's day of trouble under the Antichrist persecuting the Jews. And we see that persecution increasing all the time. Uh, the uh, current even news last night, missiles flying out of uh, Lebanon and all that. They're just being attacked almost on every side. The book of Je uh, Je Zechariah says they will. All nations will be gathered against them. And I think we're seeing that gathering taking place now. So uh, we recognize that uh, the church age is getting close to an end. If it ends with a rapture, so God picks up his timetable again with the Jews. And folks, I hope your baggage is packed. You're ready to go. Uh, you know the Lord Jesus Christ. No doubt about it. Because the sound of the trumpet calling us up might be any time. Look with me. That's what I kind of got off on on the two-day uh, example uh, of the last verse uh, that we read in verse 43. Chapter 4 of John, now look at verse 44. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Now you can pick up that quote of Jesus that he's referring to here, John's referring to. You can find it in Matthew 13. You can find it in Mark 6, where Jesus, of course, and by the way, in those same passages, you can find out that Jesus in the flesh was the firstborn of the Virgin Mary before she came together with Joseph. God was the father. But following that, Jesus had brothers and sisters. Amen. Both of the sisters and brothers are both mentioned in those two passages. So when you go to a, a religious uh, place that says the Virgin Mary was uh, immaculate, she... They, Say he had no brothers and sisters. That was only no, no, no. Joseph and Mary had kids, and the Bible clearly tells you so. And that those two portions of Scripture, Matthew 13 and Mark 6, <clears throat> tells you that. And the people knew the names, and the names are given of some of them. And uh, what they were saying was. How can he do these miracles? We know him. We know the family, and we know his brothers. We know his sisters. Uh, is it just this, the carpenter, the carpenter's son? You know, that's the way folks talk about, uh, talked about the Lord Jesus. 
A lot of preachers have had to face that where God saved them. They were sinners like myself. They got saved. God put a calling on them. They feared to answer it, especially among the, the same people they grew up with. I remember the battle I fought with the Lord to surrender to preach and tell the crowd uh, that God was calling me to preach. I just done everything I could to not admit to myself that was so. I finally did at a youth camp. I was thinking about it this week at our, our youth camp out there. We, we hear the report read, so many say, praise God, so many made decisions. Well, how many of them kept the decisions? We don't know. That's between them and God. I remember the evangelist preaching at our youth camp. We had rented some buildings. Our church didn't own its own camp, and, and we had a pretty good group out there, and uh, I talked with uh, preachers during the week and all that, and, and God had been really wrestling with me over it. And uh, you know what? I had seen people make decisions and never keep them, and I didn't want to be one of those. <laughs> I wanted to be sure it was going to be real. Well, you can't guarantee you're going to fight the devil after you make a decision for God. There's no doubt about that. And I saw too many that looked like failed. So, But I remember... Uh, the last night of the camp meeting, and we'd had a good camp. We'd had several saved and some really good preaching. And uh, I talked with the evangelist some during the week. Every preacher, I've had young men come to me through 50 years of pastoring here. How do you know when God's calling you? They don't like my answer. I didn't like the answers I got when I asked the same question. Uh Old pastor I had a lot of respect for told me after I explained, and said, this couldn't be God, could it? He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, don't surrender unless you have to. That bothered me. What he was saying, if it's, he finished it up. He said, if it's really God, you're going to have to surrender. <laughs> and I didn't like that. But I had to take it for an answer. And I've given that same answer to a lot of young men in, in the last 50 years. But uh, I remember that last invitation at the last camp, and the invitation was over, and we're wrapping up the camp, getting right down to the last amen. And the evangelist looked. He said, Mickey, you out there? Yeah. Come here. <laughs> Front of everybody. <laughs> God's calling you to preach, isn't he? <laughs> I know. Oh, well, he said, you know it. So right there in front of my home church, uh, I said, I believe he is. From that point on, I guess, like it or lump it, I've been a preacher pretty much. Started preaching pretty close to that time. But you know what? Just like Jesus said here, uh, a prophet's not without honor, save in his own country. I've pastored in this town 50 years, a little over. And um, I've had people walk in just to see if it could be true. I've had others make big predictions. He won't last. <clears throat> I had some to come see if it could be so. I've had all kind of stuff said. Uh, I joke about it, but we moved in the little parsonage here on the road right behind the church. When we, when we moved in, it was a clay road. Ridgewood Avenue was clay. And uh, the church began to grow. <clears throat> we needed some buildings <clears throat> for Sunday school as well as our tour. <clears throat> living in a little house there. So met with the deacons and we decided to put Sunday school in that little house and let me move somewhere else. So uh, we rented a place and started and moved off where the church could turn that building into Sunday school. And I joked about it. I already been preaching by that time here about two years and, and um, seen a lot of folks saved and probably made a few enemies too, whether I knew it or not. I, I joked with my wife. I said, have you noticed there's hardly a car to ever passes this clay street during the day, but when we back that moving van up to the house, everybody, we had a tour of cars coming by. Want to see if he's really leaving. <laughs> what they didn't know is I didn't go too far. <laughs> but I joke about it, but this is such a true statement. So when God called me back to Haynes City to be the pastor, I quoted Jesus to him. You're... Son, the Lord Jesus said, A prophet's not without honor, save in his own country, among his own kindred. And I talked to God about it, but I want to tell you something. God interprets his word also. 
And while that statement is true, and we, I'm talking about things I recognize as being true, God can override that, and he did. And a lot of folks that came to see if it was real found out it was. And a lot of them got saved. I come into the office this morning, church office. They still let me have a key to it. <laughs> I came in, and at the top of my desk was a, a special post letter, big envelope, <clears throat> confidential, Pastor Carter only, laying right on the desk for Brother Parsons placed it there, I guess, where I'd see it. Uh, Sister Anita, somebody put it there. So I opened it up. I first started not to read it. Because a preacher don't want to read anything negative before he comes before folks because it'll crowd you in your mind, mess you up. You didn't know that, did you? Preachers have to watch out for what they feed the mind just like you feed your tummy, amen? And uh, I thought I'll read it after church. Then I curiosity got the best of me. And I opened it up. And guess what? It was good. It was positive. It was a lady, and I remember... Uh, she sent a picture, of course, it don't look like she did then. But she was about 20, 21 or two, maybe. Came to church, got saved. Served here a couple of years anyway before moving off. And she just wanted to write back, <coughs> encourage me, that she was still serving God. Now, you add 50 years to whatever her age was then. And... Uh, Thank God some, sometime you get something positive, amen, something good. And, uh, and, and that was it. And through the years, some folks that said, well, it won't last with Mickey Carter. Well, it did. And I think I'm getting pretty close to finishing it up, uh, truthfully. So this scripture is true, of course. And it is a common truth. But there are exceptions to it. So if you've ever had a little complex about, I don't want my friends to know I'm a professing Christian or I'm a sold out to God, one of the best things you can do is get bold about it and right up front never be ashamed of, of selling out to God and serving the Lord. Turn that thing over to him. I said last week, I'm going to repeat it again. <clears throat> President Trump says he's saved. That's his own testimony. I know a preacher that talked to him personally about it, a good preacher. Claims he's saved, claims he believes in the rapture and, and all that. You know what would have been best for him if he'd have made a real big deal? I got saved when he started. I like what he said this week. Franklin Graham prayed a great prayer at the convention, spoke and, you, and quoted John 3.16. But Trump said, uh, Franklin Graham wrote him a note. And the note told him to clean up his language. <laughs> now, I'm thankful Franklin did. I'm thankful that Trump was at least bold enough to say it. Not only that, he said, I'm trying. <laughs> I remember when I got saved, I had to try it that a while, too. I think about the old preacher that was late getting home. I'm sorry. The old farmer that was late getting home for supper, driving his mule and wagon. And uh, his wife said, how come you got home so slow? He said, well, I come across the preacher hitchhiking and I picked him up. Said, after I picked him up, my mule didn't understand nothing else I said. <laughs> Anybody got that? You, got, you, you zeroed in on that. Well, when you get saved, if the Spirit of God lives within you, he'll clean up the outside. And part of that's got to be your vocabulary. Amen? All right. Somebody, some preacher told me, I, I could call his name. He didn't run really all that far here in Florida. He said, I <clears throat> kept having a lady, school teacher, or educated lady, come out the door and shake my hand after I preached. And said she'd always point out the English flaws, flaws in my English. Words I'd misuse, like ain't and so on. And uh, he said, I kind of got tired of it. Said, finally, she'd come out one day. <laughs> I'd made some word wrong, said something wrong in my speech and words. He said, ma'am, let me tell you something. If you'd have known me before I got saved, you wouldn't have understood anything I said. 
Now, I understand what he was talking about, amen? That's just one of the things that we have to give up for the glory of God and want to give it up. Won't, you see why? I, I won't get back to the book of my clock. I'm going to stop the clock to tell one more story. When I was driving race cars on the track and still, still at home, I was 22 years old when I got saved and got married that, later that year, but left home. But from about 18 to 22, about four years, I was running the race crowd. I was uh, big into it. And uh, I knew it was wrong to take the Lord's name in vain. I'd heard that all my life. I knew it was wrong to say some of the bad words that was common talk with us guys working on the car in the heat of the day and the things that go wrong. And we was turning the sky blue sometime, all of us. But I didn't like it. I didn't like doing it, but I did it. And uh, I remember, before I was saved, thinking, you know, if I'd clean up my lameness, because once in a while I'd slip up and say something in front of Mother, and I'd be so sorry I did it. And I thought, if I just, I believed in God. I believed in God in the time I was in the third grade on, at least. But I wasn't saved. So um, I remember thinking, this was just superstition with me somewhat. That if I'd clean up my language, God had blessed me to win more races. I mean, I, a lot of folks, you know, I'm going to do this and God's going to award me all that junk. Anyway, I remember working hard at it for a few weeks, three, maybe three weeks. And I was watching myself and I didn't, I mean, I really done a good job, just my willpower for about three weeks. And then one day. Through a mistake one of my crew had made, my stirring column locked up. I jumped the fence and went over in the, out in a man's garden behind his house. <laughs> Lucky landed on my wheels. It was, a, it was a mess. I got back in. We was trying to get the, and but just before that race, some of us had got something wrong, and we returned, and I was, I caught myself turning the air blue. So then when I jumped the fence, I said, uh-huh, God got you, didn't he? <laughs> just superstition, no, no scripture, just didn't know any Bible, wasn't saved. And uh, so I hated it even before I got saved. Then when I got saved, I knew I had to stop it. And so help me by the grace of God, I could count on three fingers the bad words I said after I got saved. It all happened within the first four weeks, six weeks after I got saved. And here was the difference. When I did it that time, it hurt inside. It didn't hurt inside before. It hurt inside because somebody was living on the inside that hadn't lived there before. Holy Spirit of God. And so that's how I was able to quit it. And uh, that's, that's the difference. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. That happens to you when you, when you say. Now listen, it don't mean you won't have to fight it. Don't mean the flesh won't rear up that old man that's been living in there. He don't like to be evicted. He wants to stay. And when the Holy Spirit gets in there and says, you get out and you shut up, he's going to rebel about that. Somebody that says, I don't know, you know, I've got a new nature now. Yeah, you have, but the old nature is still there too. That's the struggle. That's the fight. I've heard Brother Parsons say, illustrated by the, the bulldogs. Uh, the white one and the black one fighting. And somebody says, well, which one wins? He said, the one I feed the most. So you feed the old nature, it'll win. It'll come out with the bad words. The old nature will do the wrong things. But you feed the right nature. You feed it with the Bible. You feed it with church. You feed it with the company you keep. There's a hundred things we could say about that, but it makes a difference. And so when the folks of the crowd that knew you, that you grew up with, says, well, we know him. We know who his brothers and sisters are. We know all about Hey, that's the carpenter's son. This was God incarnate in the flesh. This was Jesus. Do you understand why Jesus was like we're going to read about the miracle here of the uh, man's son being healed in these next few verses? You know what Jesus was doing? He was God coming human flesh and the nation he came to, Israel, didn't believe him. John 1 says he... he Came unto his own, and his own received him not. What's he doing the miracles for? What's he? He's trying to get them to believe. John says the whole book was written that you might believe. And so the truth is, 
Uh, the ordinary man could not do what Jesus was doing, yet they were trying to say he is an ordinary man. We know who his mom and dad was, his brothers and sisters. We know that. And, and yet, how can he do this? See, that was a mystery, but that was what was going to make Jesus distinctive and outstanding and above everybody else. And all of history now, 2,000 years plus since then, or close to it, look at the, look at the whole world recognition of Jesus. You see the big cathedrals, we may not uh, believe all the doctrines of, of a lot of the big liberal so-called religious organizations, but somebody believed and cared enough to build all the buildings, to print all the art and all, all of that, uh, the music, the art, the architecture, all of that, that is a testimony that Jesus was not an ordinary man for the whole world to bow down and worship him. So, yes, he was a prophet in his own country, and he said, I'll have some folks there that'll say exactly what they're saying. Don't we know him? Uh, that's exactly what happened to me. It happens to every Christian that's saved. The old crowd is wanting to see. They knew you before. They want to see if there's a difference. You got a right for them to inspect you. Don't be mad about it. Uh, it's easy to make excuses. It's better to not have to make excuse. Let your life be a picture. Let your life be that that will point others to Christ. I've had folks say this in my ministry. Well, if God could do it for him, maybe he could do it for me. He can do it for anybody. Anybody that will come and believe on him and trust him and accept him. So I'm going to move off that verse. It'd be almost spent my time on it, but it just kind of kind of jumped out there. That's still a very, real big truth. And I argued with God about it. But God overcame it and, and really made a plus out of it instead of a negative to, to a great, great degree. I'll look on a little bit further. Verse 45. Then when he was come into Galilee, these are local places like we talk about Haines City, Winter Haven, Lakeland or somewhere. These are all places that the, the common people knew about. And so it says when he was Come into Galilee. The Galileans received him, having seen all the things. Watch it now. They see and they hear about him. They've seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast. For they also went on the feast. That feast is the Passover. If you read the scripture carefully, you'll find out there's four Passovers during the ministry of Christ. And he himself was the last Passover. The Jews have tried to carry that on, but it's been empty. They have no lamb to sacrifice today. And if you see a Jewish family as devout as they are, when they celebrate the feast of the Passover, they don't have a lamb. Because the last lamb died on Calvary. And God supernaturally has prevented them from having a sacrifice ever since. What do they have for substitute of the lamb at the Passover today? They have a shake bone. No meat on it. Representing. And they... Tried to substitute it with, with a chicken, but there's a lot of difference in a chicken and a lamb. Because God stopped them from sacrificing a lamb. See, they don't have the temple area. Back. They have the area, but they don't have control, have not taken control. I said the other day that Hamas used for an excuse that they were about to start offering the sacrifice again. Is the reason they had to attack and all that uh, Muslim stuff. But the truth is God stopped them. When Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished, he was the last lamb. And God would not sanction another lamb to take the place. The lamb was always a picture that Jesus was coming as the lamb of God. It was always, every lamb slain in the Old Testament was a picture God's going to send his lamb. And of course, that lamb was Jesus. Moving on through the text here, though, just a little bit. Uh, these folks here... Galileans received him. They'd seen what miracles he'd been doing at Jerusalem at the feast. They were there. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee. He'd been there before. It identifies it where he made the water wine. That was the first miracle. We're going to see the second miracle here in, the, in this chapter in the next few verses. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now it's quite possible this no, nobleman could have been just a Roman, but he could have also have been a Jew. Um, Nobleman means a ruler or a courier. He was in the government. And uh, 
He'd been hearing. He'd been seeing. So it says in verse 47, when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went, into, went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now here's a daddy loving his son. I don't know where he'd been to the physicians, probably had. He probably had some means. He was a nobleman. But he, he was turning to Jesus. He'd heard about Jesus. Now he's seen some, perhaps, of, of Jesus. So he, he comes to him to plead for help. Then Jesus said unto him, verse 48, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. That makes me think he might be a Jew. Because back in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said the Jews already see, always seek after sign. And no sign will be given them but the sign of Jonas. As Jonas was three days and three nights in the, in the belly of the whale, so shall the uh, Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The sign was the resurrection. And he said, the Jews always want a sign. So what are you saying? Here comes a father. He believes enough to seek out Jesus. He's heard. He's seen. And now he, he, he loves his boy enough. He, won't, he wants some, some help. But Jesus is reading his heart. If you read between the verses here, you'll find this man also had his doubts even when he come to Jesus. We, we would too. If you, if you heard of a great physician you went to him, you'd still have your doubts if it was true what you'd heard. Maybe in what, even what you'd seen. So he comes to Jesus, and Jesus reads his heart. You, you want to see a sign. You don't, you don't fully believe yet. You want to see a sign. And that's basically what, where we live today. Aren't we there? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I won't raise mine. But have you ever prayed for a sign from God? <laughs> we all probably have at some time in our life. And we might believe we received it. And we might have received it. And then God might have said, I'm not going to give it to you because you're supposed to believe me anyhow without the sign. Do you understand? In the real prayer of the Lord Jesus to his father in John 17, he prays for you and I that believe without seeing. I've never seen Jesus. I've heard preachers tell about him being a, a hundred foot tall. I don't believe them for a minute. I don't believe they saw him no more than I have seen him. I have seen him in faith. I have seen him his works, but I've never. And the picture you see of Jesus on the wall is some man's idea. They have no picture of him. Be careful about that. Uh, a lot of foolishness go on. Uh, a lot of images that we're not supposed to worship. No, I'm going to get off on that. But just to say, just to say, I haven't seen him, but I believe on him. Have I ever had some doubts? Every human being in his physical side will have some doubts. No doubt about it. There was a man came to Jesus in the Bible and the Lord asked him about his belief. He said, yea, Lord, help my unbelief. What was he saying? He was saying, yeah, I believe, but I also got some unbelief in there. Help me get rid of it. And that's the flesh. That's human nature. So here, trying to finish the chapter in two minutes, the nobleman says, sir, come down here, my child die. In other words, he, he didn't stop and argue. He just said, that it's so urgent. And, and, and Jesus seems to honor the, the urgency of it, knows how the man cares. So he says unto him in verse 50, go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed, believed. But even there, we'll still sense maybe a little unbelief. He believed the word that Jesus had spoken to him, and he went his way. Rightfully so. That's what he should have done. That's still all we do today is believe and, and go on. Then it says, and he was now going down, as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to mend. They said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And himself believed. Now we could say he's fully in belief now. And notice this. His belief left, led to his whole house believing. It always. The more you believe and tell others, the more chance there is others are going to believe also. And that's our job. We're supposed to be winning souls, but not just necessary. You may not be a soul winner that 
has sat down very often with somebody and showed them the Bible and led them to the Lord. That's the right thing to do. But I'll tell you what you are doing, good or bad, they're looking at you. You are a witness, good or bad, for the Lord Jesus. This man's belief caused his whole house here. Whole family is what it means. And so it says, the last verse, this is again the second miracle that Jesus did which he, when he was come out of Judea unto Galilee. Now the first miracle was the turning of what? The water to wine back at the marriage of Cana back in uh, chapter 2. So what we're doing is seeing the early start of Jesus' ministry on earth. When you read the book of John, it does not cover as much time days-wise, weeks, months, period of time as some of the other Gospels. But it hits the points, the big points, to make you believe that Jesus was the Son of God. These men, after the woman was one at the well, came out of the village. They said, we, we believe not only because of the woman's word, but we heard him ourselves that he's the Savior of the world. That's the purpose Jesus came for, to show that he was God come to save. And uh, thank God one day this old boy believed that and never been the same since. Amen. All right, Brother Smith. Might have went over a minute, Brother Burton.